we have you here though because you've got money mindset you're you're a hustle and grind uh success win entrepreneur mm-hmm. ceo yeah. you're someone yeah. who thinks about money thinks about economics and it's a big week for money which is very real because we're approaching the debt ceiling mm-hmm. and now congress has to act and you know traditionally when, when we've been in this situation congress will just raise the debt ceiling it's happened time and time and time again throughout our lives and the opposition party or the, the minority party the party's not in the white house will act like when they're in this situation we have to do something about the debt we have to do something about this we can't just keep raising the debt ceiling and racking up all this national debt so when republicans uh, are in the minority or don't have complete control over Congress, they insist it is the time to cut social safety net programs. Mm-hmm. And that's what they're doing. They're trying to, they or they their proposal is to, you know, slash SNAP benefits, uh, kick 2 million people off of Medicaid, cut all of these social safety net programs to, quote, rein in the national debt. Now, Jessica, you're somebody who thinks about the economy and thinks about, Uh, monetary theory when you hear these arguments and when you see them you know parroted in the media what do you want viewers readers you know political followers whomever to understand about these types of moments and why a you know a, a republican platform of trying to cut social safety net programs is not going to address this, quote, problem. Yeah, uh, I would want everyone to know that it's all bullshit, uh, first and foremost. But I want them to also know why it's bullshit. So the debt ceiling has been raised, I believe the correct figure is 78. It's over 70 separate times since 1960. That's a lot of times. Nothing bad has ever happened, right? We've never defaulted. Uh, And why is this time different? It's not. That's the simple answer. Uh, People like Warren Buffett, who is a billionaire, Berkshire Hathaway, people like Alan Greenspan, former chairman of the Federal Reserve, many different people uh, who have been on the side of capital are not radical progressive economists by any means. Uh, They have said that it is impossible for the United States government to not make good on their promises to pay out securities, government Uh, treasury bonds. They will never run out of their own currency. They can simply issue more dollars. They hit a button on a computer and the the debt can be essentially paid off. That's how it works. Now, are there consequences uh, to everyone cashing in their treasury bond at the same exact time? Sure, there would be. Uh, That might put us in, in an inflationary time. Essentially, what a treasury bond is is a a really secure investment. So you could put your money into the stock market and potentially get a higher return. Or you could say, you know, I'm going to put some money in a treasury bond and really guarantee the steady rate of return of like 2%, which is much lower than you'd expect if you were, you know, investing in, uh, you know, Wall Street, typical investments, but uh, it's guaranteed. So the way Buffett would put it is, Uh, we should never have a credit downgrade because it's literally impossible for the United States government to not make good on their debt because they are the ones who create the currency. They can just create it to pay it off. Their credit rating would be like a triple A. So the fact that there's an idea that default is a potential consequence or something that could happen in the near future is the most deranged and insane concept. Um, And it's literally a political tool for them to cut social safety nets. Why? Because they get a lot of money from lobbyists, uh, from their shares that they hold in companies when profit margins are high. And when people have a difficult time accessing food, accessing healthcare, meeting their basic needs, they're more willing to work longer hours and for lower wages because they're desperate to meet those needs. Uh, That's basically the game. And it's been a a big game they've been playing for far too long. Other countries don't have debt ceilings. They don't come up with this imaginary number. You know, we can't put more dollars into the economy than X. So it's insane and it's bullshit. Well, and like you're pointing out in America, it only really became a partisan issue like quite recently. Um, And I think it's interesting how kind of like fiscal conservatives have made this kind of argument. And I think the media has also been... Mm -hmm. 
a, a big part of this, of talking to people about the economy and making this analogy that, well, it's just like your family budget. And when you're overextended here, then you've got to take out loans here. And when you don't have enough to pay, but the government is not like a family budget. It is not like that at all. That analogy makes no sense. Um, if you had a money printer in your basement and you could just in, create money in your home, maybe that would be more of a similar analogy, but there's no connection whatsoever. But people try and like dumb down these economic concepts to make people understand this idea that, oh, we're, we're too in debt to pay for these, to pay for schools or to pay for food stamps or whatever social programs, but it's a completely useless analogy um, that's good. It's totally mis misrepresents the way that the government and the state works and the way the economy works, right? Yeah. Yeah. It just doesn't apply. The government is not a household when it comes to, to money. And the main difference between like when I need some extra cash and let's say I don't have it, my option is uh, to take out a loan, to go into debt, whether I have a credit card or a bank loan, it's money that I get from somewhere else that I have to pay back. That's how a household budget works. So when we hear the word deficit, we think, oh no, like Uncle Sam's gonna knock on my door and like ask me for this money that they have to pay back to who? Where did the money come from in the first place? Uh, because the government's a currency issuer, we are not. We can't just say I need more money, I'm gonna make it myself. The government can, and they're tasked with managing the money supply. They can do that well, or they can do that poorly, but nevertheless, they can spend more if they deem it necessary. They can afford to make good on all of their promises. And when they decide what to cut, it's very different from how we decide what to cut because our income is very concrete. We know how much money we're making. We have to work more to make more money. Their revenue and expenditures operate in a very different way. Uh, so they can issue bonds uh, to fund public programs. They can also simply just press a button and the dollars exist. Uh, the U.S. government has the power to put new money into the economy without issuing bonds, without uh, having to go into debt. Bonds are basically interest bearing dollars that some people might want to have. And Obama, when he was stumping, would make it seem like we go to other countries and ask them for money. He says that the U.S. government took out a credit card with the Bank of China and your grandchildren are going to have to pay for it. Now, foreign countries have a vested interest sometimes in holding American dollars. There are a lot of people who live abroad that want American dollars and might want, you know, treasuries. They might want to buy these securities. That does happen. Is the entire deficit uh, money that we owe to other countries? No, absolutely not. And so there's so many lies and there's so much confusion, but really the one constraint to government spending is, is this money going to put real productive resources to use? And Alan Greenspan actually would say this as well. And he is a, a pretty conservative former Fed chair where the one concern we have is, are those dollars going to be able to purchase things, uh, going to be able to purchase things of value? Uh, how do we resource the spending? Are we putting dollars into the economy that are not going to put more people to work, more tools, land and machinery to use and grow the economy? Uh, so that's really the main concern that we should be making. This story that they tell that I think McCarthy told recently on the House floor uh, that you would be irresponsible if you were doing what the U.S. government is doing uh, financially. But that's not at all what's going on. The deficit's like a record of every dollar that has been put into the economy that hasn't been taxed back out yet. So to eliminate the deficit would mean, where are the dollars? There are none. It's necessary to have dollars in the economy. So their red ink is our black ink, as Stephanie Kelton puts it. Kelton's book, The Deficit Myth, really helped me understand how deceptive the right-wing messaging is. Yes. Oh, there you go. Yes, nice product <laughs> well, placement. Yeah. It's great. And it really helped me understand how deceptive the right-wing rhetoric is around the deficit because they, the Republicans like to make people think it's just like your household budget. And reading that book really helped me understand that, no, it is not. We all don't have a you know neatly divided slice of the pie that we are personally responsible for. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, from her perspective, a modern monetary theory perspective – it's all just kind of bullshit because money is fake and we could just print more money. And it's, it's much more fluid than Republicans, especially in scenarios like this, want you to think. When it comes to funding the military, 
th- there is no there is no concern for how much what the money supply is or how what our national debt is or def- the deficit is. That's all fine. Every military budget is inadequate to the Republicans. But I also found it funny that in these debates, one of their proposals is to slash veteran spending by like twenty percent. And this is you know these are people that they love to use as you know propaganda tools and talk about how thankful they are for their service but in in this moment they're trying to cut veterans benefits people who to them pay the ultimate sacrifice serve their country whatever put their put their life on the line when these fucking freaks won't and this is their this is the way of saying thank you when veterans benefits look for better I, i've made my thoughts in the military quite clear over the years but if that's something you want to do that's your right you should at least get covered and get taken care of by that government after your time in in the military. But even for the people in the party that love to pander on military issues, they won't they won't do it. They're they're trying to cut these benefits, which is just really uh, encapsulating of how disingenuous that party is. Yeah, absolutely. And also, when you just compare eight hundred forty two billion for the Department of Defense hasn't Pentagon hasn't passed an audit in five years. And what do they want to do with SNAP benefits, which by the way, is 113 billion pale and pales in comparison to when we look at defense spending, what do they want to do? They want to make sure you have a job. You're working for X amount of hours every single week in order to be eligible for SNAP benefits, commonly known as food stamps. That's insane. When the federal reserve's explicit mission right now is to decrease employment numbers. So not only are you going to make it more difficult, you're going to uh, damp down on what's going on in the economy and make it so that there are less jobs available because it's more difficult to take out a loan with the bank because it's more expensive. Less people start businesses, less people invest in businesses. They want there to be less jobs because their working theory is that this will bring inflation down, which has never been proven in the data. And we know that there's ulterior motives there. And it's like, you want to make people unemployed and then you're going to take away their ability to eat. That is what the U.S. government under McCarthy is doing right now. Yeah, that's good for the economy when that happens. Um, It's it's actually just using that kind of language just shows how completely sociopathic some of these uh, economists are when you actually get dig into like what their ideas actually mean in terms of human beings who are not just like numbers on a spreadsheet, but like living, breathing people who have like needs and need to eat and need shelter and take care of their kids and education, all these things. Extremely, extremely sociopathic people. Yeah. Um, It's actually kind Mm -hmm. of fascinating to me. I mean, one kind of narrative that we've been looking at over the last couple of years, and, and there's been a few times where it felt like there is this kind of populist thread in the conservative movement that wants to increase the social safety net rather than decrease it. And we've been wondering for a while, is there going to be this kind of transition when these neoliberal Democrats get kind of lapped by these uh, reactionary conservative movement that actually wants to increase people's uh, benefits and social safety net? Certain people's, obviously, and certain outgroups, no. Um, and it's amazing how, like, even when with COVID, when under Trump, there was this kind of and more of a genuine social safety net in America was erected that hadn't really existed prior to that with the child tax credit and the unemployment benefits that were genuinely like transformative and life changing for millions of people. And it's amazing to me that not only that that all got rolled back under the Biden administration, but that Republicans haven't clued in that like, that's a winning message that they can like go after them on that and work to restore those benefits. But they're so wedded to this, ideology of austerity and fiscal conservatism that they're they're really trying to take away like from from the people that really have the least in society and just instead fixating on these culture war issues trans women in sports and these things which a lot of normal people like don't care about normal people that are trying to survive and trying to get by um so it's just it's incredible to me not only how Democrats have bungled that, but about how there is this opportunity on the right to kind of even as a completely cynical ploy to gain power, but they're so wedded to these very reactionary politics and and fiscal conservatism that they just can't do it. Yeah, it's it's so true. Uh, and understanding like that the neoliberals in both parties are are and have been pushing for privatization of public goods that should be funded by the government. Uh, And using the debt ceiling 
as this tool, as this bargaining chip for this big game of chicken where they can just push more cuts and more austerity. Uh, now that it's come around again, we're really getting to see who's on the same team in this fight and who's on a different team. And watching the interview with Eric Trump, when I believe it was him and McCarthy, uh, but him and one of the more neoliberal members of the Republican Party, uh, not one of the, the members of the hardcore Trump faction. But Eric Trump said, we can't cut Social Security. Like, we're not cutting Social Security, right? And it was a, a pivotal point in this conversation where it's like, we're establishing that, that this is not on the table. And I wasn't expecting to hear that from someone like Eric Trump. But there's this interesting brand of right-wing populism where they're defending public goods, things that really matter to working people. Of course, I don't believe their, their motivations are pure. I don't think they really want to live in a society that's built for everybody to flourish and live happily. I think they're probably doing it as a way to claw back some political power and support. But then what are we going to do as the people who want the economy to work so that we can meet our material needs uh, and not so it's not run for the benefit of these people who want to experience endless profits and privatize things that we really value. Privatizing things like Social Security would mean everyone has you know, their own retirement fund with Vanguard or what have you. Like they really want to just keep clawing all of the economic resources in our society and keep them in their grasp. And they are keeping us divided, as you said, on these other social and cultural issues. And it's like, are we going to have to be so starving and desperate for housing, healthcare, food, and our most basic needs that we just withdraw and start from scratch and everybody just says, okay, we're not working for you anymore. Uh, we're going to start this thing over again. I don't, I don't think it's ever going to get to that point. I think it's more likely uh, that people don't even realize the two-party system is as big of a problem as it is, and these culture wars end up making people get violent before any economic motivation does.